Hello, uh, our names are Jackie Shen and Jessmar Walia, and we are the current curriculum chairs of Medical Students for Sustainable Future. And we're gonna be help, helping to moderate this panel today with some amazing students who have done a lot of great work at their respective institutions. So just to introduce MS4SF a little bit, um, MS4SF was founded in April of 2020, and it's a national network of medical students in the US who recognize climate change as an urgent threat to health and social justice. We're over 430 students strong across 100 medical schools globally. And our motivation is really just to protect our future patients and the communities we love by catalyzing action to prevent and address the health harms of climate change. So we'll be moderating, moderating a lively question and answer session today with some incredible medical students who have been who have graciously joined us. Um, but before we introduce them, here's some background about myself and Jackie. I'm a rising second year medical student at Albany Medical College, and Jackie's a rising third year at Tufts University School of Medicine. We're really excited to be moderating this panel because we believe that physicians will not, own, will not be able to fully care for their patients without a comprehensive understanding of the many ways in which climate affects health. And we believe that building this knowledge should start in medical school. So before we introduce our panelists, we'd just like to take a quick moment um, and acknowledge that the ground beneath our feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples. And I know we're all zooming in from different places, um, but we wanna recognize that many of these indigenous peoples have been forced to leave for other lands and we want to also remember that Indigenous peoples are not a people of the past, but some may be here with us now. Um, and if there are any Indigenous peoples on this call, you're invited to share your tribe so that we can recognize you. All right, great. So to start off, we'd like to ask each panelist, how is your school integrating climate change into MedEd? What has the timeline been for these changes and what were the strategies used to implement them? If anyone from the audience has any questions while our speakers are talking, please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, you can either post in the larger group or send them directly to me and Jackie, and we will try to get all of them answered by the end of the panel. First, we'll invite Natasha Sood to speak. Natasha is a third year medical student at Penn State College of Medicine. She's also a founding member and the current chair for MS4SF. Prior to medical school, she completed her undergraduate training at the University of Michigan and her MPH at Columbia. She's looking forward to talking with us today. And I think we're a few slides ahead or behind. Yes. Yep, yeah, there we go. So go ahead, Natasha. Hi everyone, uh, thanks Jackie and Jess Mahar. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so at my institution, uh, we are working on a two week fourth year elective for medical students. And uh, this elective really encourages students to reflect on the basic science and clinical sciences threads that they learned about um, during their first through third years of medical school, um, as well as the health systems science thread that we have at my institution. Um, and really examine all these concepts with the climate change lens. Um, we learn uh, through this elective, students will learn um, how climate change impacts individual and population level health, um, how it impacts the health system and how the health system in turn impacts climate change through um, waste streams and emissions. Um, and uh, in order to first broach this topic with our administration, um, we, we formed a student team. Um, we wrote a proposal, we met with our deans. Um, and then from there, um, we really um, developed a uh, syllabus. Um, and then we sought to find some grants and some funding to fund the project, the time, the resources that we would need um, to facilitate the elective. And from there, we sent it off to approval for our uh, medical um, in our medical education uh, department. Um, one thing that we found really useful was having that funding and that backing, which we were able to get through our undergraduate in, uh, institution. Um, and uh, we also found it incredibly useful to have um, faculty uh, members um, on the team who would help champion um, our our projects and our initiatives. Thank you.
Great, thanks, Natasha. So next, uh, we'd like to hear a little bit from Carly Hampshire. Carly is a fourth year medical student at the University of California, San Francisco, planning on applying into internal medicine. She's the founder and current co-director of the Planetary Health Report Card Initiative, uh, the Planetary Health Report Card Chair at MS4SF and a fellow with the University of California Carbon Neutrality Initiative. Building on her interest in medical education and climate health, she will be taking a gap year beginning this summer to pursue a research project investigating the infectious disease outcomes associated with extreme weather events in people with HIV, further develop the PHRC initiative, help launch the new Center for Climate, Health and Equity and work on climate curriculum development efforts at UCSF. So a lot going on, take it away, Carly. Hey everyone, thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak with you all here today. Um, in terms of our climate change medical education efforts at UCSF, a couple years ago now, a group of amazing faculty and students were successful in applying for and receiving an education grant to integrate climate health and sustainability education longitudinally throughout our preclinical curriculum. And in putting together their application, they actually were able to use the planetary health report card as a need assessment and mapping tool specific to UCSF. They also use the small but growing climate and health education literature, as well as their own assessment of the most relevant intersections between climate and health to map out a pretty comprehensive set of curriculum objectives. And then they worked closely with the course directors of the various organ blocks in our curriculum to discuss how to add those objectives and associated content. And to date, the group has been successful in integrating climate related themes into several organ blocks, including our pulmonary block and our social determinants of health block. And then over the course of the next year, they plan to weave the environmental threads even more comprehensively, adding content in small groups throughout preclinical. Unfortunately, right now, some preclinical curriculum development efforts are on pause due to some larger changes happening in our curriculum. Um, that's way over our heads, but hopefully this restructuring will serve as a good opportunity to add things without disrupting what's already there. And then in addition to this preclinical curriculum development, some other ideas that we've discussed in future directions, um, adding a two-week clinical climate and health elective to the more clinical third or fourth year, adding hospital sustainability projects as an option for our already required hospital quality improvement group projects, and then making sure that community environmental organizations are included as site options for a soon to be required fourth year community engagement rotation and project. And then to your second question, um, I think hopefully I touched on some strategies for implementing these changes throughout, but just to be a little bit more explicit, I think it's really key to integrate climate and health content into curriculum that's already there whenever possible, rather than adding something standalone. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, I think it makes the ask of adding content to an already really extremely full curriculum a little less hard to swallow for administration. It's easier to say, hey, can we add a slide to this lecture on asthma about air pollution? Or hey, in this small group on social determinants of health and structural racism, can we add a discussion point on shade equity? Um, and as you all know, climate change intersects with basically all social determinants of health, basically all organ systems. So integration is a really natural structure here. And then two, like, let's be real, listening to a lecture listing off all of the harms of climate change one after another, what our world is headed for, that is just so existentially stressful. And I think our minds just shut off. We just can't hold that much grief. And so to have it sprinkled in with everything else, um, dry, drawing connections where appropriate, I think is a lot more manageable and probably sticks with students more. Thanks, Carly. Um, next, we'll hear from Savita Potazaru. Savita is a third year medical student at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences in the MD and PH dual program. She's currently one of the co chairs for the Climate Smart Healthcare with Medical Students for a Sustainable Future and one of the founding members of the Climate Health Interest Group at GW. Savita is very passionate about promoting eco medical literacy and is working with her current curriculum deans about curriculum reform. She hopes this framework will become standard in medical training and continuing medical education. Savita. Hey everybody, thank you for having me here. Um, I did have a couple of slides to share, so if you can move to the next slide, that would be 
through. Thank you. Um, so eco medical literacy is a framework that we have used at GW to get our curriculum reform process going, and I have found that it has helped one depoliticize climate change in a lot of conversations, um, and also provide a, a literature based framework uh, for us to present our recommendations. So the definition that we use in our meetings with our deans is that. It is the ability to access, understand, integrate, and use information about the health-related ecological effects of climate change to deliver and improve medical services. Um, next slide, please. So some of the competencies that have been published in the literature about EML relate to sustainability and healthcare and what that looks like on an individual level versus the population level, um, as well as the bioethics of sustainability. And when you think about all of the different arms in our very complex medical curricula, um, there are places for all of these competencies and that's kind of what we, we use as our foundation. Next slide. So using the Planetary Health Report card, which was uh, done last year, um, we used our performance at the C-level in curriculum to uh, present some improvements that we think we could make to our curriculum deans. Um, and we are currently in the process of moving from committee to committee. Um, we are most recently, we had on April 13th this year um, to our themes committee. And we kind of talked to them about the need for this longitudinal integration um, in our four-year curriculum and what that would look like in the preclinical setting versus the clerkship setting. And so they were super inspired by that. And now we're moving to the specific preclinical committee. And then after that, it's the clinical committee and then QMEC, which is this like overarching one. So it's kind of been a series of presentations, but um, a lot of forward progress, which has been awesome. Next slide. So we kind of, uh, approach this in in two different ways. The top-down approach involves faculty um, using our recommendations to develop learning objectives and competencies, which are widely um, available in the literature now and is also a growing body of knowledge um, to set the foundation of what this would look like in lecture content, in case studies, in um, on the wards, and um, and beyond. So, kind of having um, somebody appointed to oversee this um, in the faculty is something that they're interested in pursuing, um, more specifically a faculty funded position, which is something that the themes committee director expressed interest in, interest in about two weeks ago, which is really, really exciting. And to support that, we kind of have a bottom up student driven process where um, we recommended having a committee of both students and faculty to support um, the ongoing review and development of these objectives and making sure that these competencies are being met uh, in our education. Next slide. So when we kind of use some of some elements of these slides in our presentations to show what it would look like along the spectrum of our four years, um, PPS, organ systems and POM um, are just examples of the courses that we have and relating to clinical public health, um, practice of medicine and our basic science class. Next slide, please. So like I said, our next steps are kind of along the um, continuum of the next two years. And so we're in the process of creating um, sample lecture slides, like Carly was mentioning, that we could integrate into existing content, case studies, um, and beyond. So we are really looking forward to all of these upcoming changes and conversations, and I'm happy to talk more about this. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. And it's so great to hear about some more longitudinal integration in the student work. Um, so finally, we'll hear from Kanika Molini. Kanika is a first year medical student at Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. She's also part of Brown's primary care and population medicine program through which is, she's pursuing her master's degree. And this past year, she's been involved with completing the planetary health report card for Brown and working to implement planetary health within Brown's curriculum. So as part of this process, she's met with various faculty members and students to implement program changes at the medical school, including climate-based elective options, research fellowships, and restructuring education regarding the relationship between climate and health. As a result of these efforts, they're implementing an elective entitled Global Environmental Change and Emerging Infectious Disease, which she will be helping to lead this upcoming fall. 
Hi, everyone. Thanks for that introduction. So my name is Kanika, and I am a part of the Planetary Health Task Force at Brown. And I wanted to give you a glimpse of the process of completing the Planetary Health Report Card and its impact on our curriculum. Yeah, we can skip, I think, two more slides. Oh, actually, never mind. That's good. Um, we can go back one, actually. Yeah. Back one slide. Great, thank you. So to begin, I'm gonna go through a timeline of the steps that were leading up to the completion of our most recent planetary health report card. So in spring of 2018, a climate and health needs assessment was completed. And then the following spring, this needs assessment helped drive the creation of the Alpert Medical School Environmental Coalition, which promotes awareness towards the intersection of health and environment. Following that, in the fall of 2019, Brown's first climate change and health preclerkship elective was created. And then in the spring of 2020, Brown completed its very first planetary health report card, which served as the stimulus for the creation of the Planetary Health Task Force. And that focuses on addressing areas for improvement at Brown as identified by the report card. We can move to the next slide. So to review, the Planetary Health Report Card helps evaluate how well medical schools incorporate both planetary health and sustainable health care at their institution. So recently, we completed our second Planetary Health Report Card, and our overall score was a B minus. So I'll elaborate a little bit more on how this score inspired change at Brown in a little bit. So I can move to the next slide. So for now, I want to go back to the timeline for 2021. This past February, Brown joined the Global Society Consortium on Climate Change and Health as well as the Planetary Health Alliance. Then, as I mentioned before, Brown completed its second Planetary Health Report Card in March. And more recently, just a few weeks ago, we actually submitted a curriculum proposal to Brown's Curriculum Committee that focused on ways to incorporate planetary health into our education. So our goal for this upcoming fall is to have a Planetary Health Task Force Committee that works as part of the Curriculum Committee to ensure that these educational changes are actually being made. I can go on to the next slide. So this is what our proposal to the curriculum committee looked like. It revolved around the creation of a four-year longitudinal planetary health curriculum at Brown. Specifically, we created certain competencies and objectives that we wanted Brown's education to meet. And now we're in the process of reaching out to our faculty lecturers to identify curricular changes based on these competencies and providing them with the material necessary to implement these changes. I can go on to the next slide. So more generally, our ideas for incorporating planetary health in the pre-clerkship years include making more explicit planetary health connections with diseases and organ systems. We also want to develop more electives and interest groups on the topic, and we were actually just approved to run an elective entitled Global Environmental Change and Infectious Diseases for this upcoming fall. Lastly, we wanted to create some funded opportunities for planetary health research and want to make more community connections with local environmental justice groups. Can go on to the next slide. So similarly, our ideas for incorporating planetary health in clerkship years include developing planetary health electives for third and fourth year students, which is actually currently in the works. We also want to develop an internship prep course for fourth years and incorporate planetary health related topics in our lectures for block clerkships. I can go on to the next slide. So this is just an example of how planetary health could be incorporated into the ob -GYN clerkship. So in particular, there's a lot of research done on how air pollution affects birth outcomes, and that is something that could be integrated into lectures. Can go into the next slide. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Um, we'll all be able to answer questions towards the end of our panel. Thank you, Kanika. Um, so we've heard a little bit from everyone. Now we're gonna ask some specific questions to some specific people. Um, and a general thread that's kind of been brought up is uh, a, this process of curriculum development. Um, that's really, you know, central to incorporating climate education into our medical school curriculums. Natasha has some experience with uh, curriculum development, and we wanted to ask you, could you talk about the origin and work of the Medical Students for a Sustainable Future Curriculum Guide? Sure. Um, so Sarah, um, Shu, and I were co-curriculum chairs um, at MS4SF last year. And when we first started talking about um, the process that we both had to go through at our own uh, institutions to get this work off the ground, um, we were realizing some commonalities and some of the barriers or conversations that we were having. Um, and so we thought it would be useful to develop a curriculum guide for medical students um, to uh, 
learn how to bring these concepts um, up, to, up to their deans of education. Um, so you just wanted to create a free, easily accessible resource um, for this reason. Um, and so in this guide, uh, students will find a um, letter to their dean of education talking about the importance of inclusion of climate um, in medical education. And in there, we also have sample um, electives, syllabi, um, learning objectives. Uh, we also have a section on the planetary health report card, which Carly um, has talked about extensively, and um, as well as links to uh, further online personal learning resources um, and certificate programs. Um, and we've we've had several students reach out um, uh, saying that this has really helped bring these topics up to their um, to their deans, um, and then that in conjunction with the planetary health report card really um, helped uh, take some action at their institutions. Great, thanks, Natasha. Um, and then speaking of the Planetary Health Report Card, um, clearly that has been used as a tool at several institutions here on the panel today. Um, Carly, could you talk a bit more about the inspiration behind that and what need you were trying to fill? And also you mentioned community organizations involvement. Um, could you also speak to, a little bit to the process of getting those organizations involved? Absolutely. Um, so several UCSF colleagues and I founded the Planetary Health Report Card Initiative in 2019, sort of struck by the profound lack of planetary health emphasis in our curriculum and institution overall, despite climate change being called, so to speak, the greatest global health threat to health in the 21st century, despite walking to school every day in N95 masks during our pulmonary block because of the wildfire smoke in the air at that time due to the campfire. And we felt that as future health professionals, we must be prepared to address the very real impacts of human-caused environmental changes on our patients' health, and that this preparation um, was kind of in the hands of our institutions providing our medical training. And then not just curriculum, I know we've talked a lot about curriculum on this panel today, but also wanted our institutions to have research facilities, community engagement initiatives, sustainable practices in their hospitals, funding opportunities that reflected the profound threat that climate change and other planetary health issues pose to everyone's health. And what's interesting is beyond this not exactly representative group of all medical students gathered here today, um, desire for curriculum on climate change and other planetary health issues is much more widespread among medical students than you would think. Um, a recent research survey that we led found that among 600 medical students at 12 very geographically diverse US medical schools, 84% of students believed that the health effects of climate change should be included in the core medical school curriculum, not just electives. Um, and only 13% of students believe that their medical school was currently providing adequate education in that regard. But the question that we had was, what does it actually look like tangibly um, to integrate themes of planetary health into a very jam-packed curriculum for a medical school and institution to take on these issues in a more comprehensive way? So to try and fill this gap and outline some specific action items that schools could take, we developed the Planetary Health Report Card, which is a needs assessment tool for planetary health and medical school. And we created metrics in five main sections, the curriculum, which is our largest section, research, community engagement and advocacy, support for student-led initiatives. And then newly this past year, we added a section on sustainability. And with crafting this report card, we had five primary goals in mind. So one, the report card would function as a needs assessment tool to identify a medical school's planetary health strengths, opportunities for growth, and then also as an institutional advocacy tool to then engage administrations directly in making necessary improvements as we've heard about from um, many of our panelists today. And then two, in putting together their report cards, schools would assemble synthesized medical school specific information on resources that could then be disseminated to faculty and students. I know it was really hard coming in as a first year medical student and not really understanding like who was doing what at the institution. A lot of the work was siloed. And so I think the planetary health report card is a nice resource for new students to say, okay, like this is the lay of the land. And then three, the annual summary report that we put together at the end of each year um, you can find it on our website at phreportcard.org, could facilitate cross-institutional dialogue, sharing of resources, showcasing examples of innovative forms of planetary health engagement, which makes it, I think, easier to propose things to schools because you can identify 
oh, look, this other school is already doing this. Can we just adapt this program to fit our setting? Um, and then four, because this is an annual undertaking, we publish a report card every year. Um, this allows for tracking school level and global progress in medical school planetary health engagement. And then five, of course, most importantly, um, as we all want to do gathered here today, we developed this initiative with just the, the lofty aspirations to advance the global health, planetary health and uh, climate justice movement in pursuit of a more equitable and healthier world. And to talk a little bit about the, the progress um, of the report card over time, last year, 2019 to 2020, we had 13 schools, 12 schools in the US, one school in Canada participate in our pilot. But this past year, over 250 medical students at 62 medical schools in five countries were involved, which I think really speaks to how passionate students are about these issues and how much they really wanna be a force for change. And it's really great to hear Savita and Kanika talk in more detail about the changes in momentum that, that it's led to at your respective institutions. Um, and I'm not sure I have time to address that second part of the question, but I'm happy to if, if you'd like me to. <laughs> Uh, just so we can get some words in from Gronika and Savita, I think we'll hold off on that okay. for a little bit. Sounds good. Um, so Gronika and Savita, we wanted to ask you, um, through the process of starting curriculum development, um, how do you think physicians and faculty can best support your efforts? That's a loaded question. Um, I think there's so many layers to this. and. Something that I think we've parsed out in our approach is delineating roles, even among students, and among faculty. So I mentioned earlier that at GW, we're taking a bottom up and top down approach. And then the top down approach, which is faculty focused, I think kind of what has been most helpful so far is advocating for us through the different committees that we need to move forward with in order to make standardized change. So for example, when we first presented to our themes committee at GW, the head of the themes committee came back to us like two days later and she was like, I'm blown away by your presentation. I'm taking your recommendations and proposing them to this committee and I want you to go present to them. And it's kind of just like, building your network of faculty who have a really powerful voice within this like really rigid medical curricular structures that exist across the country and world and having them uh, create a space for us to, to um, share our voices and our passion. I think that has been most helpful so far. I think if I were to imagine faculty support once the, our curriculum change is already being implemented, it's making sure that it has an element of longevity. So do we have a faculty member leading curriculum review relating to climate change and health yearly or biannually? Um, do we have someone kind of spearheading it um, on an ongoing basis and also continuing to give students a voice as like each new generation of med students come into each school? Yeah, going along with that, I would say uh, very similar things are happening at Brown in terms of the ways that faculty are getting involved. For us, it's also super helpful to have faculty just be able to advocate for the changes that we want to make. So again, there's a bajillion different committees that are involved in all of this and you know the whole sort of process of it. And so having these faculty members say, okay, you know, I'm going to take charge of this committee and then I will direct you to another one. Um, it really helps us sort of climb up that ladder, especially in the case of, you know, like just, I think it was last week, we met with clerkship directors and that was through the help of some of our faculty members. Um, in addition to that, all of our electives require faculty advisors. So having people who are willing to take that role and do a little bit more uh, so that, you know, pre-clerkship students are able to get this early experience of planetary health um, and organ systems and diseases is super important and really helpful for us. Um, but in addition to that, I think research is a, is a big thing that we personally at Brown, we want to get students involved in, in terms of planetary health. And so having faculty available to mentor students in those positions is really important. And we're in the process of gathering faculty who would be interested in this. So there's a, so many different things that faculty have been doing and that would really help us make sure that this is a longitudinal aspect of our education. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, so we have a couple of audience questions and not a whole lot of time left. Um, we saw one question mentioning the role of the uh, AAMC, NBME, and LCME. And so I just want to throw out this question to all of the panelists. How do you see these educational organizations um, in MedEd playing a role? I can start um, and would love for others to jump in as well. I think it is so critical to have these medical organizations on board. Um, I think organizations like Medical Students for Sustainable Future, Planetary Health Report Card, are great at you know, grassroots from the bottom up, trying to influence uh, schools and integrating more planetary health curriculum and other resources. But we also need that top-down support from these medical organizations. And when you're proposing adding new content to deans, um, they're, they're faced with a really overwhelming task of trying to fit so much information into not that much time. And lots of people, in addition to planetary health, um, climate change advocates are also pushing for their own interests in, in um, curriculum concepts to be included. And so I think that if the NBME decided that, oh, this is one of our priorities, this is something that students can be tested on, then it becomes a lot easier to um, have administrations take on the role of integrating climate health content. And I think that's sort of where we're hoping to go next with the planetary health report card now that it's off the ground a little bit um, is using it um, as a tool to like lobby these larger organizations to show case all of the interests that students have and, and argue for why it's important. Kind of guy, I saw that you unmuted yourself for a second. Yes, I did. Um, I just wanted to add to that the fact that I think what it is is that right now, oftentimes schools see planetary health and climate change related topics as sort of optional. Like, you know, oh, if we have time for this, yeah, we'll try to include it, but there's just so much going on that we don't know if we'll get to it. And if you make it so that these national exams, include topics that need to be covered, then med schools have more of an incentive to actually like make sure that this information is being um, covered in lectures. And I know at Brown, there is a group of students who are working on uh, petitioning to make sure that step one includes questions on planetary health and climate change. So they're creating simple questions and sending them to the organization to show them that, you know, you can incorporate this in, it is topical, and this is something we do need to learn. Great. Okay, so um, to just try to get to some more of the questions, um, we're going to move on. And Katrina asks if there's any synergy or any space to collaborate with public health schools and similar programs in climate health and med ed. So if anyone has any thoughts on that. I love this question. I think something that has come up um, in our discussions about the different ways we can integrate climate change in health education. Something that GW I think does particularly well is its focus on clinical public health. And um, in our first and second years, we have an HIV summit, an asthma summit and obesity summit during our third year actually, where we get to work with the community. We work with public health students at Milken, which is a public health school, um, to come up with uh, interventions for the community to address really pressing public health problems. And I think um, the impact of climate change on human health definitely falls into that category. Um, so in our proposals, when we've recommended climate change and health education to be integrated into the clinical public health arm, we've brought up that we should have like a summit for um, eco-medical literacy and promoting this in our education uh, with the collaboration of schools with students in the public health school um, because their experiences and their exposure um, and their studies are so vital to um, the work that we want to do together and I think it's the schools even right across the street if you know it's safe for us to interact in person that's something that I feel like would be so valuable to share a space um, and really talk about the impactful change we can make with our background in like clinical sciences and some exposure to public health and then their like full-on exposure to um, community engagement in public health. So I think it is an element of the curriculum recommendations that we've brought up and people have been really excited about that idea. Um, 
anyone else have any thoughts before we move on to the next question? I can jump in really quick again. So I am doing a master's at Brown as well, and my master's in population medicine, which has a lot of overlap with the School of Public Health. And so one of the things that we've really been working on is legislative testimony. So a lot of our students, actually everyone is required to do some sort of legislative testimony. And there are a lot of options for climate related testimony, given you know Rhode Island's location, it's the fastest warming state. And so having students go and advocate for policies and bills that they think would support um, you know, planetary health is super important. And that's a good way to integrate you know, med education and public health. Awesome. And there are so many more things to talk about. And I'm loving that there are so many resource exchanges and contact information exchanges in the chat. Um, but just to wrap this up, we're going to ask one final question to all four panelists. Um, and we're hoping this can just be a quick way to share something more personal. Um, the question is, um, where was your initial exposure to climate health equity? Was it in med school, college, high school? Was it outside the formal education system? Just give us a little story, quick. I'm sure I can jump in real quick. Um, I, uh, in college, I did an alternative spring break trip um, at the University of Michigan. We went to uh, New Orleans in the ninth ward and um, we were working with an organization called Greenlight New Orleans, and we were um, planting vegetable gardens um, in the community, but we were also working with uh, individuals in the, the, that neighborhood um, to change out their light bulbs. Um, and we were just talking to the residents, and that's I, that was my climate and health moment where I realized that you know the increasing severity and frequency of natural disasters not only have health impacts during the storm, but they had long-lasting impacts. Many of the residents were struggling with PTSD. They still had um, developmental delays. Their children um, were had been spread out throughout the country, and and that's when it really hit me that um, I wanted to center my career um, in this field. And um, so that's where I came from. We'd like to hear from one more panelist. I can speak a little bit about that too. Um, so I grew up in San Diego and over the course of my childhood, my community was burned down twice by wildfires. Um, luckily my house was spared, but many of my friends had their houses burned down. And these wildfires were ones that burned more destructively thanks to human made climate change. And then, um, in college, I majored in anthropology with a focus on migrant and refugee communities. And throughout my coursework, I was struck by how the root causes driving people from their homes could often be linked back to climate change, whether directly or indirectly, and how climate change was going to lead to so much more um, displacement in the future. And so while I had some environmental involvements in college, when I came to medical school, I decided that this was going to be my main focus. And um, I've been really excited to join this lovely community of like-minded folks. We love hearing how people get involved with such an important mission um, and a way to really like improve the health of all of humanity. Um, but we are coming to the end of our time today. And we'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their insights and experiences. Thank you to our audience for being so thoughtful and engaged. Um, every time we hear about the work that these dedicated advocates are doing, we walk away energized and encouraged, and we hope you all do too. If you're interested in learning more about ms sf or the Planetary Health Report Card, follow the links that we've just posted in the, ch in the chat. Um, thank you for joining this workshop on addressing climate health and education. We hope that going forward, we can all find ways to support each other.